Okay. Now we have to bring on our next guest. Uh, uh, Stefan Kinsella is a registered patent attorney, libertarian theorist, and a lecturer, director for, of the Center for Study of Innovative Freedom, and executive director of Libertarian Papers. He's published numerous articles and books on IP law, international law, and the application of libertarian principles to legal topics. He received an LLM. I don't know exactly what that is, but I think it's a legal uh, note uh, recognition. An international business law from King's College, London. A JD from Paul M. Herbert Law Center at LSU. I guess if it was an LSU, it was probably Bear Law Center. And BSCE and MSCE degrees from LSU. He has a book that's going to be coming out soon. Uh, it's titled Law in a Libertarian World, Legal Foundations of Free Society. And it's going to be published by Liberty.me and next year. So it's going to be coming out probably after the first year. Uh, Stefan, welcome to the show. Yeah, I see there. Is his microphone muted? Uh, Chuck, he uh, should be connected to us here. It shows up on my screen. Yeah, we're he maybe had to go to the bathroom or something. Okay. <laughs> I had to do that one night, I remember. Well, I said, uh, he's, in, he's in the chat. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? We yes, hear you. Now. Okay, sorry, it's a microphone problem. I, I just took my microphone out. I'm glad to be here, Chuck. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, yes. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to uh, gonna have to do, put a headphone or something. I'm getting an echo. Yeah, give me just so, a second. While you're doing that, I'm going to. Uh, Stefan probably has his uh, console running on uh, UCY. Oh, uh, let me see. Um, Maybe. Um, um, no, hold on a second. I'm hearing myself I, just as I speak. So, um, yeah, anyway. anyway, I first came across Stephen, Stephen um, when he delivered a speech at a Mises Institute gathering about uh, really thinking intellectual properties. And it was... It, it literally changed the way I thought about intellectual property. And the guest we just had on Richard von Sternberg from as the founder of the American East Star Company. Uh, immediately, I thought of him when I saw when I watched Stefan's speech. I says, "This is exactly what happened to Richard." <laughs> and um, so I use. He's been somebody that's been on my kind of on my screen. I always wanted to read anything he wrote and um, uh, can, listen to. Can, is it, can you hear me now, Chuck? Perfect now. Perfect. Good. I think I had a bad so, mic, but that. Yes. So anyway, uh, it's been gosh, it's been about it's been about seven years since that speech, I think. So I've I've had many many a debate with people who would debate the things that I used to believe. To me, and I would, I found myself um, defending all the things that I'd learned from you, <laughs> and and kind of attacking their positions because I thought they were just fundamentally wrong, and it was it's very difficult uh, process. But I was able to at least convince a, a large majority of the people that I did talk with that the the intellectual property laws weren't working the way they're supposed to be working, and so um, I think that'd be a good place to start is maybe talk about some of the abuses of the system and maybe uh, actually we should probably go back a little bit and kind of explain how the patent and, and copyright system is intended to work and then we can go into why it doesn't work. Well, so uh, the way it's intended to work, you, you can talk about the way it's sold right now and the way it's stated by legislators when it's enacted or you can talk about the real sort of the real purpose behind it. Um, I don't think the stated intent of patent and copyright law is really what is the real intent behind it. Um, the stated intent is to encourage and promote innovation and artistic creativity by providing you some kind of financial incentive to, you know, to, to be compensated for producing innovations and in, inventions, artistic works, things like that. Um, this is the common argument given for these laws, copyright and patent primarily. Uh, other types of laws that are similar are trademark and trade secret, but we don't really, unless you want to, need to go into those. The two, the two big ones are trademark. I'm sorry, patent and copyright. <clears throat> I think that would be enough. I just, I just, we're just trying to. I, I, I think it's 
we're trying to see how the uh, they've been kind of taken over and controlled by other parties that we're supposed to be protected from. So, so, so for a short history, um, you know, we haven't had free markets forever. In fact, we don't have free markets now, perfectly. And there's always been uh, use by people in power uh, of their ability to control things for their own benefit. So, you know, back in the days of mercantilism, uh, you know, say several hundred years ago in Europe, the kings would grant favors to people. Um, so they would say, I will give you the monopoly on the right to sell soap. Or you, you're the only person who can trade sheepskin in this area. That's called the patent or a monopoly. And in exchange, they would, you know, the guy would help, help the king collect taxes or he would get his loyalty. So it was basically an exchange. So the, the, the crown used their political power to grant a monopoly to protect someone from competition or to give them a monopoly over a given area in exchange for some kind of favor or some kind of service. Yeah, uh, I have a, I have an interesting story that just popped in my head from my days in the jewelry business. Uh, mm-hmm. The first person who discovered how to make porcelain china, it was kind of a, a you know, a, a, he took it to the king to show him what he, had, what he had done. The king immediately had him locked up, and he was then, from that point on, only to make china for the king. <laughs> and that was, that was kind of how they protected that intellectual property. Uh, the, the innovation of the person that had the brilliance to just, you know, Figure that out. He was then a prisoner. He was well fed and well clothed and everything, but, but he was a prisoner nonetheless for the rest of his life. As they didn't, the king did not want anyone else to have the sacred. It was it was how he became rich, and that was uh, one of the things that enriched <laughs> that bloodline of people throughout Europe was uh, yeah the uh, the uh, Wedgwood China Company was founded from the descendants of, of that king. Well, and this gets to the modern confusion over the justification for patent and copyright. Um, so patent, which people now say is used to stimulate innovation and invention, was really originated in the grant of monopoly privileges and anti-competitive uh, you know, control of the market by the crown. Copyright um, was originated in, in the government and the church's uh, fear of the printing press because – they didn't want ideas to get circulated widely that they didn't they didn't approve of. They didn't want the average person to be able to see. So they instituted these guild like structures that controlled what books which books which books could be printed. And so one example would be the stationers company in the say fifteen hundreds in England. Um, this culminated in the Statute of Anne of 1709. And by the way, the patent statutes culminated in the Statute of Monopolies of 1623. So they were actually called – it was called the Statute of Monopolies. There was no bones about it. Nowadays, we call it intellectual property as sort of a cover for what it really is. But originally, the government was pretty uh, plain about the nature of what they were – Doing, but but the interesting thing, and, and your your story reminds me of this, is that the authors of books who were controlled by this guild, the Stationers Company, and later by uh, the Crown's copyright type regulations, what they wanted was the ability to publish their own books without permission of anyone else. This is why they were in favor of copyright, because the copyright statute, the Statute of Anne. Appeared to give the right back to the authors because it said now the authors have the right to control who can publish their works. They weren't seeking this right so they could extort, you know, royalties from people and keep people from copying their works. They were doing it so that they wouldn't be prohibited from doing it. But very soon after, the publishing uh, industry stepped right back into the role it had had before because you had to have a publisher to publish your book. And so you had to assign your copyright back to the publishing industry. So this has led to the situation we have now where most authors even today have sold their life's work to some publishing industry company. And even if they wanted to publish a sequel or to authorize a foreign translation of their own book, they can't do it. And if they don't have a big bestseller, the publisher might forget about it. It goes into oblivion. It goes into this black hole of unpublished works, which no one else can authorize, even the author can authorize it. So you have this mythological 
idea that the patent system is for the little guy, the little inventor, and the copyright system protect, protects authors and musicians, when in reality the copyright system has propped up the publishing and the music industry and forced these creators to sell their souls to these large companies. And the patent system basically benefits large companies like Apple and Samsung and even Google, but almost never the small inventor. Yeah, um, I actually think that uh, uh, Microsoft, the last or the next innovation that they come up with might be their first. Uh, I think they exist solely on just buying up other companies, uh, taking all their patents and going out, going to court and seeing who, how many royalties they can harvest and fines and things they can collect. Um, it's it's uh, it's turned into kind of a joke. It's not even close to the stated purpose of the of the patent. What a copyright. Well, yeah, not only that. I mean, the uh, so the 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 so-called stated purpose in the Constitution is that um, Congress is authorized, and this is the Constitution enacted in 1789, authorized Congress to protect the works of authors and inventors for limited times uh, to promote the progress of science and the arts. And by the way, science in those days meant what we would call the arts now. And the arts meant what we would call science. Now it's sort of backwards because arts meant like uh, the work of artisans, like uh, you know, people that make inventions or innovations or horseshoes or whatever. And science meant just the general knowledges, the knowledge sciences, you know, um, literature, etc. Um, but it only authorized Congress to protect these for limited times. And originally, the copyright law protected works for 14 years extendable by application of the holder for of, uh, for another 14 years, for 28 years maximum. And by the way, 14 years was there because it was a term of two consecutive apprenticeship terms. So the idea was, uh, let's, let's give this guy a monopoly privilege uh, over his inventions or his copyrighted works that last for about the length of two apprentice terms because by that time he can – train them and use their services, and then maybe they can compete with him after that, but he's got enough breathing room to compete with his own apprentices, something weird like that. Well, now copyright lasts for the life of the author in America plus 70 years, so that's well over 100 years in most cases. Um, yes, and, and not only that, but um, companies like Disney have copyrighted Snow White, <laughs> which they didn't even write. Yeah, well, they copyrighted their their version of it, so that that would be a derivative work. But the original work was public domain, so they didn't need permission of any copyright holder. But so they came up with the derivative of it, which was itself original, so it was covered by copyright. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 you have right now. I mean, this is being negotiated as we speak. The Trans Pacific Partnership, which is a huge treaty which is being negotiated by America and Western and Asian countries that represent about 40% of the world's GDP. It's been negotiated for a couple of years in secret. It, it holds itself out as being for, for a pro free trade agreement, but as released like yesterday or today on WikiLeaks, there's a huge IP section, which seeks to force the other nations to adopt America's, Copyright terms. So most countries of the world have signed on to the Berne Convention, which America forced them to sign 20, 30 years ago, which is, which says a copyright term has to be life of the author plus 50 years. America added, tacked 20 years onto it when Mickey Mouse's copyright is going to expire, courtesy, courtesy of Sonny Bono, um, of, of, of Sonny and Cher fame, uh, you know, the congressman who ran the tree when, to see skiing. into a tree, yes. Exactly. Um, this is literally. And by the way, we, we're all over yeah. this uh, Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement. We've been posting it in our Facebook page, all the, all the news, as much news as we can find about it uh, for about, well, it's, it's, about a it's, month. Yeah, it's horrible. It's not, it's not free trade. It's, not, uh, it's called well, it's free only, trade. It's only free trade for a few uh, select insiders. It's kind of like free trade inside a vacuum uh, bell. Everybody it's else on the outside, yeah. we're, we're, we don't have free trade, but those people inside that, that bell, the bell-shaped vacuum thing, they, they've got free trade. 
Yeah, it's man, it's managed trade, and it's. Um, it, but the worst thing is, it, it it's not only managed trade; it, it it extends IP law. It's trying to extend uh, draconian U.S. style IP law, which is the worst in the world, basically, to other countries to make them extend their burn convention uh, copyright coverage by twenty years and other provisions as well. Um, thank God that this thing was leaked. Although I don't know if it's going to stop it. You know, we defeated SOPA and PIPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act and the uh, another counterfeiting act, and the Anti Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, the ACTA, has been ratified by a few countries now, and all the, a lot of the provisions of both of those laws are in the TPP. So these guys don't give up, even if the internet rises up and stops one of these laws. These lobbyists just work behind the scenes, and they just they they put it into another bill or another treaty or another trade agreement. And they just – they keep going. The, the, the forces are inex- inexorable. Yes. Well, um, let's uh, – I want to just kind of take a sm- small detour. This is kind of still in the same, in the same vein. Um, in the, the speech you're giving, there were some real hilarious things you were, you were showing about the um, – some cases that actually came out were uh, patents – or went to patent, went to trial because patents had supposedly been violated. The one that made me laugh the hardest was the one that Amazon brought against um, uh, a, a book company. Is it maybe it's? Uh, well, I think the, you're talking about the, the, the one-click patent they brought against yes. I think Barnes and Noble right before Christmas season yeah. about about six or seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah, because it was they they owned they had patented the one-click. <laughs> they patented a method for like completing an online transaction by having a shopping cart representation and allowing the sale to be completed by making one click instead of two or three. Um, so really it wasn't technological. It was just kind of the business idea. And by the way, Jeff Bezos, who I think was the actual inventor on that patent, who's the CEO of Amazon, Jeff Bezos has come out in the meantime. He says he thinks that software patents – the term should be reduced from about 17 years, which is the typical patent term now, to, to about three years. He really thinks software patents are harmful. Um, uh, of course, that's a little self-serving because Amazon ha- hasn't used that since, and it, it helped them demolish their competitor for one Christmas season, probably made several million dollars off of it. So they've already gotten the return on their, on their $10,000 patent. Um, and now they're going to change but, the rules yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, in that um, there was another one in that uh, presentation you showed a um, in your PowerPoint. Uh, there was a like a sculpture of a uh, a hand um, making a one finger salute. Is that's a pat- that's a copyrighted design, or is it is a design patent, or I don't know. Exactly yeah, that the was a, uh, I've got the if if if, if your uh, if your listeners want to see that, I've got a. Um, um, a speech I gave at the Mises Institute. Oh, yeah. It was the Rothbard Memorial Lecture. If you just go to stephanconsella.com and go to my media page, you can find it. And if you click on that link, I've got the slides I used and um, some examples of, of absurd patents. And that one was probably a design patent. I think it was the it was the sh- uh, the shape of a hand giving someone the finger, flipping the bird, mm-hmm. used on a ornament or a trailer hitch or something like that. I forgot exactly where it was. But yeah, that was a design patent, which is a, a type of patent. And that that was that somebody would would actually be allowed to have a design patent on that was to me was kind of absurd. That's probably been what is it? I don't think like a a three or four thousand year old symbol. Well, but actually, to be honest, design patents, so there are several types of patents. There's plant patents, which has to do with asexually reproduced pants, plants. There's design patents, which are sort of like copyrights or the way things ornamentally look. And then there's utility patents, which is the patent we all think of. It's a, a patent on a useful or you know, something that has utility. It's a useful uh, 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 machine or process. Um as silly as the design patents are, they're not that harmful in practice. The most harmful ones are the utility patents. And not only that, as much as we hear about junk patents and patents that shouldn't have been granted because they're obvious, you know, the invention uncovered is obvious, 
Or as much as we hear about patent trolls, people that sue people even though they never made the product that is covered by the, their own patent, these are the least harmful uh, 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 applications of patent law. The most harmful is the utility patent that is not a junk patent and that is not asserted by a troll. That is a patent that is a high-quality patent. That is a patent that should have been granted according to the patent rules, a patent that covers an invention that is unique and is non obvious and is useful and is covers a product made by the person asserting it because those are the types of patents that are used to hamper competition. The entire purpose of a free market and property rights or, or one of its characterizing features is that we ought to have free competition. And if you see someone doing something that is successful and pleases customers, you can enter the field and compete with them. That's what competition is all about. The, the entire purpose of the patent system is to stop that, is to say that you cannot compete with someone for some silly reason, but you can't do it. They can use this patent to prevent you from doing something too similar to what they're doing. And if you step back and think about it, there's nothing wrong with emulating or even copying what other people have done as long as you, you, you use your own resources and you sell to your own customers. There's just nothing wrong whatsoever with that, and for the law to stop it is is mercantilist and protectionist, and it's anti-free yeah. market. It's anti-free property. It's exactly what I believe. Um, someone in, during that speech, someone made a question from the audience, and I didn't, I couldn't quite hear the question, but you were talking about the there's a once they grant a patent, there's like an 18 month waiting period before they even publish it, so nobody else even knows it's a it's what its contents of the patent are for 18 months. Well, this is a relative. That, yeah. So this that, is about, did I understand that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Until the law was changed in the 1990s, patent applications were kept secret until the patent issued, which could be 10, 20, 30 years. That's that gave rise to what's called submarine patents. That is. So someone would file something and in the meantime, and they would keep refiling it in secret and changing it a little bit. In the meantime, someone else would independently invent something covered by the patent, and, they, and a whole industry would arise to be covered by it, like, say, windshield wipers, intermittent windshield wipers, something like that. And then the patent owner would let the patent emerge like a submarine emerging from the sea. That's why they call them submarine patents, and sue everyone based upon the current market size. Well, in the 1990s, the law was changed pursuant to the GATT Treaty, the, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and the TRIPS Agreement, the, the trademark, the uh, trade-related oh, IP aspects of the trade agreement. Um, it was changed so that you had what's called a provisional patent. You could file it a year ahead of time to get a placeholder, and the patent term was changed at that time from 17 years from the date of issuance to – 20 years from the date of filing. They did that partly to counter the, the, the submarine patent problem. And what they said was, if you want to take advantage of this new system, um, now we're going to publish your patent application at 18 months. So at 18 months after you file it, all patent applications now become public unless, unless you file a disclaimer at the beginning saying, I promise you I won't file for international trademark uh, patent protection. So in most cases, you don't want to do that. You want to keep open the option of filing an international. Yeah. So um, patent on your patent, and so in but, that case, your patent is published at eighteen months. Right, but so that's still you have if if you're in a like a uh, state of the art type of uh, you know innovation. There's a lot of people trying to create this next, uh, let's say, like in, in cell phone technology or something. And you come across this great idea and you, you're the first one, you get your thing in there. It's going to be secret for 18 months and someone else might come up with something else and start building a similar product. Maybe based on that same idea, one would violate your patent. So then they are then liable for something they didn't, they couldn't possibly even know about. Well, that so, correct? so, uh, well, that is. Potentially correct. So, but how would they know about it? I guess if you're selling the product already. Right. So you're selling a product and you have a patent pending that is secret. Um, you're supposed to mark your product patent pending and then patented once it's patented. 
You don't have have to. And by the way, Obama changed the law a couple of years ago so that the penalties for failing to mark your product patent pending or patented uh, have almost disappeared. Under the old law, that is two years ago, before two years ago, if you fail to mark your product patented, then you are really at a disadvantage when you're trying to sue people later because the idea is, well, you had the chance to put them on notice and you didn't. So it's not fair to extort them for money now. Well, now the penalties for failing to mark are almost non-existent. So they basically got rid of the, the marking requirement. So it's even worse in a way than it used to be. Yeah, well, it's, I, I think it's really slowed down, um, the innovation process across the board. I mean, America used to be the place where everything was invented and not so much anymore. Um, uh, you said in your speech that that one I'm referring to that same talk again. That's the one that first grabbed my attention. I always use these examples when I debate with people. They're the ones that are easy for me to remember. But you said something. I think it was Switzerland and another country in Europe. They had abolished their um, their patent laws or changed them uh, com- so that they were, they could be more competitive, more competition in the marketplace. And they found out that innovation didn't get worse; it got better. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, and if you look in, a, I've got a blog post about this, but there's also, if you go to um, my website, c4sif.org, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, if you go to my resources page, I link to a book by some friends of mine called uh, Kelly Boldrin and David Levine called Against Intellectual Monopoly. My work has been mostly sort of property rights and libertarian-based. Theirs is more empirical and utilitarian, and they examine the empirical case. And in Chapter 9 of their book, Against Intellectual Monopoly, they examine the entire case for pharmaceutical patents, which is usually held up as the 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 obvious case for patents, like we have to have it for, for drugs, for pharmaceuticals. And they look into this, and they show that there have been long stretches in modern history, like 20, 30, 50 years at a time, I think Switzerland was one. I think Italy was another. Well, they just simply didn't have a patent system that covered pharmaceuticals, and yet they were among the top pharmaceutical producers in the world for a while. Um, there's lots of empirical studies like this that show, I would say counterintuitive. It's just it's against the contrary, the, the received wisdom. But uh, they show that, that innovation is perfectly possible and very prevalent in the absence of patent and even copyright systems. Yeah, um, and I think that that's to me is perfectly is perfectly reasonable because I think there's a lot of people now that um, their their resources that they have are being put into um, uh, they're being put into the things like uh, 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 staff attorneys on staff to protect the patents. They're they're trying uh, when they do develop something, they're going to go on and cover as much of the market as they can to make sure that they aren't violating the patent. So they're spending a lot of time and energy on things that aren't producing any products and not producing any more innovations. They're just trying to you know, cover their rear end and, and you know, possibly keep them from getting, especially the smaller companies, because uh, we saw uh, beforehand what, uh, what happened to my friend Richard in the diamond industry. Uh, he was just squashed like a bug by big, big money that, you know, they copyrighted a uh, a trademark that made it impossible for him to talk about the superior nature of the product that he was producing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, he couldn't. He had to. Well, the, the, go ahead. I was going to say that the, these laws, the, the common perception of these laws is helping the little guy is just completely wrong. Um, what happens in reality, especially nowadays, it's gotten worse in the last 20 years or so. Um, th- think of the think of the smartphone wars. Right now, there are do- literally dozens of, of patent lawsuits going on around the world in different countries between dozens of country uh, companies like Amazon. I'm mean, sorry, Apple and uh, Samsung and various other players in the smartphone areas and sometimes apple or the other guys will be on the receiving side sometimes will be on the on the uh, aggressive side and what this does is they're, they're i mean literally spending tens or hundreds of millions of dollars per year 
on legal fees alone, just funneling this to pet litigators like people like me to litigate these battles. Now, what this does is it, 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 it means that only companies with a large patent arsenal, which also takes millions of dollars to obtain in the first place, can even engage in this. Only large established companies, the big players, can afford to pay these lawyers to be the, on the defense or the offense. So what it what it does is it basically shuts out the smaller players. They can't even afford to enter the field. So it erects yeah. barriers to entry. It creates an oligopolized industry, which means an industry with one or two or three or very small number of very large players. So these laws, which the state grants monopoly power to companies – not surprisingly, results in monopolistic behavior. So it actually hurts the small companies because they – believe me, if you're a small company trying to go public or you're just small trying to eke by on your meager you know, angel funds or your friends and family funds or your very small profits, if you get sued by a big, a big competitor or you get a big demand letter saying you have to stop or we're going to hit you with a patent lawsuit, and it's going to take you $5 million to defend yourself, you have to cave in. Or or even better, you just don't enter the field in the first place because you know that it's impossible. So patent law actually stifles you know, individual entrepreneurship and innovation. It doesn't help it at all. Yes. Yes, and um, when, they, um, when the when the small guys, even though there, there might be like a – uh, little mouse compared to an elephant in terms of the, the size of their competition. That still is, it forces the big guys to produce new products so that they don't get, uh, they don't lose their market share to these little startup companies. And so when they don't have to worry about those guys anymore because they can crush them legally, they don't have to worry about innovation so much anymore because they've got the market. This is what we're going to produce. And you're going to buy it. Uh, yeah, I think that, um, well, and not only that, if you have a patent on a product that's popular, um, uh, then you have less incentive to innovate because you don't need to in the free market. Oh, yeah, that'd be cutting out your cash flow because that product would cease to be sold if something new came along. <laughs> well, yeah, and not only that. I mean, uh, people talk about the pharmaceutical case as the paradigm, the paradig- paradigmatic case, you know, the standard case that argues for patents. But, um, and I'm not denying the benefit of some modern wonder drugs, although. If you look at the modern wonder drugs that we've had in like the last 50 years, almost none of them have been patented. All the great drugs of history that have cured millions of diseases, they've pretty much been not patented. Um, but, but the point is if you're a, a pharmaceutical company and you can come up with a, a, you know, some drug that cures some problem and you can get a patent on it, which one are you going to promote? That one or some homeopathic natural remedy? That no one has a patent on. I mean, there may be in some cases. I mean, I'm not a big homeopathic, naturopathy type, I, uh, but the point is, in some cases, I think that those those remedies are as good or even better in, for some types of afflictions or maladies or, or conditions. Oh, yeah, there's but, there actually seven. That's something I've spent a lot of time on because I had a really bad uh, hypertension issue, and the uh, medicine that they were putting me on to control it was making me feel horrible and. Uh, the doctor just told me, well, I'm just going to have to live with it. So it's how you're going to be the rest of your life. And I just refused to believe that. So I went, started reading and I found that actually if you eat the right foods, your body will repair itself and your blood pressure will return to normal. And there's some lifestyle changes you might want to, you know, think out, you know, to change and things like that. So in my case, I was able to get off seven different pills and I have normal blood pressure now and a lot of other chronic Symptoms that I had of other things to come, maybe down the road, like diabetes and things like that, have all disappeared, just just because I eliminated a few problem foods from my diet and I started eating more nutritious food. So, so there's a lot to be said for some of these things. It's just getting um, just getting the essential new uh, minerals that you need to have healthy organ function. Yeah, uh, it's really important. But yeah, but the point is the big pharmaceutical companies are not going to be promoting this because it's not in their interest. To. Yeah, and I don't, they, I don't blame them for not supporting it, but the point is they're, of course, going to support the patent system because that allows them to patent some newfangled remedy, which they can charge a monopoly price for for, for 17 years or something yeah, like that. They're even trying to get mono- uh, patents, monopoly patent status on some 
uh, designer vitamins that are basically their synthetic vitamins that when we have better vitamins that occur naturally that work better in your body but they you know they they, they patent these and then they they can get doctors to prescribe them they can make a lot of money so um, I think we can talk a lot about how the system's broken for probably another couple hours because there's a lot of examples um, I think everybody gets the the idea here that it's not there's something wrong. So what kinds of, um, you had some great ideas on things that could uh, improve the situation and, and make uh, make the system work closer to how it was intended. And then you could go over some of those. Well, honestly, I think the best solution would be to abolish patent and copyright. I think they are both contrary to the free market and private property. Uh, so the easiest the best solution would be to get rid of them. And by the way, I also believe there's a good argument that patent and copyright are unconstitutional because they were both authorized in the 1789 Constitution. But in 1791, two years later, the Bill of Rights was ratified. And the Bill of Rights has many provisions which are contrary to patent and especially copyright. So, for example, the First Amendment says that the government shouldn't, uh, you know, uh, regulate freedom of speech or freedom of the press. Well, there's no doubt that granting a copyright, which allows someone to go to court to get government force to stop someone from printing a book, is a regulation of freedom of the press. So if you were a strict First Amendment, first, uh, you know, a freedom of press, freedom of speech rights type person, you would see the conflict between freedom of the press and copyright clause. And so there's a conflict, and the courts see this, but they try to balance it. But they shouldn't try to balance it because the First Amendment came after. So it should repeal the copyright clause. So I would say – and and there are other other arguments you could make for other – you could you could argue that the Eighth Amendment on the ban on cruel and unusual punishment applies to these crazy statutory fines, statutory penalties for copyright violations. Um, the Fourth Amendment, the search and seizure, is violated – all the time in enforcing copyright law. Um, the Fifth Amendment due process is violated by uh, assuming someone's guilty just by showing that their IP address was used to download a movie even though you don't show that they did it. So there's lots of arguments in the Bill of Rights that are in contra- conflict with the copyright and even the patent clause because the patent law also results in censorship in some cases and other and other things. So if you stop short of this crazy kind of radical abolitionist approach, if you wanted to get closer to what the Constitution says, then first of all, the Constitution says the purpose of Congress being granted this power is to promote the progress of science and the arts. So I would say first, do no harm. You can only, Congress should only issue copyright monopolies and patent monopolies when there's a reasonable basis to believe – that it promotes progress of science and the arts, which means they should have a study. Now, at the beginning, 1789, they didn't have time to do studies. Okay, fine. It's been 230-something years. They've had time to do studies, and there's been dozens or hundreds of studies done, and guess what? None of them prove that these laws actually promote the progress of science and the useful arts. So until they can come up with reliable studies that it does, I think the laws should sunset or should be abolished. But short of that, if you wanted to improve things, you could at least go back to the original um, systems. Uh, the proposal in the copyright realm is called the founder's copyright. Let's go back. Let's go from seven, life of the author plus 70 years back to 14 years. Let's require registration of copyrights instead of having it be granted automatically. Just a couple of changes like that would radically improve the process. In the patent field, if you could simply um, get rid of injunctions and say you, you can get a royalty from someone who's using your idea, but you can't stop them with a court injunction, that would radically improve it. If you would shorten the term from 17 years to, say, five years or three years, that would radically improve matters. So there are several practical things that could be done. Except that some of these things would violate treaties that we have insisted be forced upon the world. So the Berne Convention arguably prevents us from getting rid of the automatic 
registration of copyrights and requiring active registration like we used to have before 1982 um, because we have Byrne and now Byrne obligates us to uh, uh, adhere to Byrne standards. So we have conveniently – Hollywood and the movie industry and the software industry ha- has – and the pharmaceutical industry have conveniently forced Congress to enact a treaty that we forced other countries to agree to. That ties our hands, and now if we say, well, we should relax our copyright standards and move backwards a little bit, they say, well, we can't. We have burn. We have to live up to. We have to live up to our international obligations, don't we? So it's, well, it's like, well, you impose this on us in the first place. We need to exit burn. We need to exit these international treaties, and we need to radically scale back patent and copyright law. Yeah, that's um, it's basically. I think the introduction you gave on the history of this, where the, they used to, they used to call it like it is, it's a it's a permission to have a monopoly, right? And, uh, that's that's exactly what it is. And uh, I, all my whole life, I've I've learned this one simple fact that monopolies are impossible without the force of government, and it, it's nowhere more apparent than in the patent and copyright laws. Yeah, I agree. I, look, if, I understand people want to be in favor of innovation and creativity and ideas, and I am too. I'm a patent lawyer, um, and I'm a libertarian, and I'm an, you know, I believe in the intellect and creativity. But we have been sold a bill of goods. These, these laws are special interest laws which benefit very narrow sectors of the economy, and they do not result in anything good whatsoever except for an excuse for tyranny. I mean, the internet is one of the most uh, Im- important tools for freedom that's ever emerged, and we cannot let the government regulate it and control what can be said on it or how it can be used. And yet, copyright law and other government laws like child pornography, terrorism, money laundering, gambling—you know these kinds of things, uh, drug laws—there the government uses these laws as an excuse to internet to regulate the internet. Um, if nothing else, the threat that copyright poses towards internet freedom is enough to to make you want to kill it, because oh, yeah. I mean, the internet is too important. If someone uh, there was a, I, I don't I did not read this firsthand, so I got this from somebody else. But apparently, just like a year or two ago, uh, Sky News, which is the equivalent of Fox News in this country in, in England, Sky News was, uh, suing. Skype because they use Sky in their in the Skype name and they thought that was an infringement of their copyright. So this is uh, this is how it can be perverted and misused and uh, used to take down one person. And even if they win a, the case, they have to pay for the court costs and it diverts their attention from progressing and innovating and everything else. So, yeah, it's, it's very destructive to society and even destructive to individuals. That that the, the who are the guys, the true innovators? I mean, they, they just get washed. Oh, like our, our first guest, Richard, told this great story about the, you know, how much, how much of, I would say it was probably 20 years to develop this eight star diamond it, from the beginning to the end. And it, it, it had a lot of dead ends and they had to go back and start over. And, um, I mean, they went through literally tens of millions of dollars to do this. And, uh, he has the rights to North America to, to, Cut these diamonds and, and to sell them there, and, and someone thinks up a way they can you know, screw him in court using IP laws so that he's out of business. Yeah, I agree. And one of the uh, reforms I proposed is um, for patent law and even copyright law is called the losing plaintiff pays rule. Now you've probably yeah. heard you probably that would heard help a lot. <laughs> yeah, you've probably heard of the idea of the loser pays rule, which I actually don't agree with the loser pays rule. The loser pays rule means that whoever loses the lawsuit should have to pay the other side's fees. All that does is magnify the potential losses of a a small victim of a of a copyright or patent suit. But if if you adopted the rule that the losing patent plaintiff pays, so that means that the only the only one who suffers from this rule is the potential aggressor. If you have a patent, let's say, and you decide to assert it against someone. And if you lose, in my view, you should have to pay the fees of the, the person that you're attacking. 
But I don't agree that it should be symmetrical. I don't agree that the person that you sue should have to pay your fees if you succeed. I mean, it's bad enough that you win under these laws, but you shouldn't be able to magnify the threat because that's just going to make them cave in even more easily. But I do think that a losing patent plaintiff rules uh, – and by the way, something similar was proposed in what the Electronic Frontier Foundation has put forward in some reforms to the copyright uh, – to the patent laws, sorry, in response to the the patent troll problem. Their reforms don't go far enough, but at least there would be some improvement. So they, they want to say that if you're a patent troll, then there are a lot of limitations on how you can exercise patent rights and whether you would have to pay the – the cost of your of your victim if you lose the suit. Okay, well, it, to me it all makes a lot of sense, and uh, just from my experience in the in, in just the world of business, I uh, I use I'll use my uh, co-host and good friend Drew as an example here. Um, he's quite an innovator in the, his field, which he's <clears throat> he's due to. Well, it'd be a long story to tell you all the reasons, but he's uh, built a farm inside a warehouse and he uses um, some natural sunlight and some artificial light. And he uses uh, an aquaponic system where he has fish that create the nutrients for the plants that create the food for the fish. And he brings in some black soldier flies and uses the, to eat the garbage that he gets donated for free from restaurants and uh, feeds those larvae to the fish and um, anyway, he's got worms that go through the stuff that the black larvae, black soldier fly can't do it, and he uses that for his plants. And he's he sells he has really good high quality food, which he sells to restaurants, and he's starting to to do pretty well on it. And he's he's innovated quite a few systems here, but if he had to stop and file patents on every time he has an idea, he he'd be out of business. Um. His 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 uh, innovations are, are kind of protected because uh, he, he has witnesses to the fact that he's he did this on this date or pretty close to this date. So if someone else comes up with it and they make him cease and desist, he could still say he had prior thought of it prior to that. Is that am I understanding the law correctly? Well, yes. I mean, if, if, if you're you're sort of if you're a small businessman and you. Um, you, you sort of face a, a, a choice right now, right? You have to either spend a lot of money to apply for patents, um, which is a waste of money and resources and time, and it could divert you too. It could, it could get you locked into, well, I've got to keep doing this kind of business technique or this kind of method because I've got a patent on this, just like the drug companies are going to you know, try to sell the patented yeah. drugs. Or you remain defenseless and you have nothing to use if someone comes after you or if someone wants to patent your own idea out from underneath you. So it's a it's a horrible choice that small businessmen face now because of the patent system. And I think for, for Drew, I think his probably his, his best uh, – the best outcome that he could hope for is to become known as the person who did this innovation and this innovation, have his name on some of these innovations, whether he gets the royalty for them or not. But that will give him great uh, speaking appearance fees, and he could maybe author books, and he could do other things in the future based on the reputation he builds from all those. I mean, he's really, he's, he's really an innovator. Uh, I'm so impressed with, with uh, the stuff he's comes up with. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's a great thinker. Um, but anyway, that's to me, that would be the way to go. And if you can find ways to uh, uh, give people those recognitions, you can – you can give them the the status of the of being an innovator, and that can be somebody that everybody respects and, and looks to for advice. And he suddenly be, has a reputation for that kind of a uh, ability. Then that he's gonna he's gonna get his rewards in a different way, not by going to court and forcing other people to give him royalties. Well, let me just say something a little bit uh, optimistic, a little bit subversive, maybe. Um, instead of begging the government to change its fascist and horrible laws, which we've been doing for 200 years now, and they're not about to do, and they won't do it anytime soon. And they, they'll go kicking and screaming because they have the big money corporatist you know, interest in their pockets. Um, 
think of the analogy of the gold community. I mean, we, we advocates of sound money and um, free market money have been opposed to the government Federal Reserve System for a while. They're not going to change it. We can beg the government or the Fed to change their policies uh, and readopt gold, but they're not going to. So what did the community do? We've adopted Bitcoin. We've done an end run around the government. Um, we've adopted our own money. So I think something like that can be done in copyright and patent. Instead of asking the government to uh, drop its laws or to, to reduce them, in the copyright field, people can just get around the government by using torrenting and encryption. And in the, in the, in the, in the field of inventions, 3D printing is coming, my friend. And 3D printing is going to become a huge way people can get around the government's monopolization of physical objects through the patent law. People can just print what they want and they can get an encrypted file with the design of it using a BitTorrent or something like that. They don't need, they don't need government permission or approval. Okay. Well, Stephen, that's our, that's our bumper music. We're all done for tonight. Thank you so much. This has been one of the best shows we've ever had. Um, and I really appreciate your being a part of it. Time.